Welcome to the second lecture on Anne Ranasinghe's life and poetry. Today we will be studying Ranasinghe's poem, Weavery in Peace. We will first start with a reading of the poem. Weavery in Peace, to live in peace. Comment on a review of an exhibition of graphics from the German Democratic Republic. Why this obsession with war and its horrors, it's, you ask? Dear sir, it is easy for you, who have lived all your life in this small island haven, and the nearest you have been to violent death is on the cinema screen. But what you have seen there is one-dimensional, lacks the second dimension of love, maybe, a third of pain, a fourth of touch, blood, sticky and warm, burned bodies disintegrate, and you confronted a shadow seared in a wall that was a man in its original state. A fifth dimension is fear, and though of course you try to shake it off, it remains a festering canker till you die. You concede that artistically, the works are good, this in casual aside, but you insist one was disturbed and horrified, but cannot live with this kind of art unless one happens to be a depressive and coyly you ask, is there such a word? Sir, you are revealing an art, not an emotion, that caused it to blossom, judging, technique, design, effect. An artist can only express the sum of his experience, not yours. And then you demand, when will the Germans stop saying, mia culpa, never, I hope. And under their mia culpa li libraried millions of dead, and would you, for the sake of your comfort, that we forget? So let's go to the beginning of this poem. So this is a poem, as Ranasinha says, comment on a review of an exhibition of graphics from the German Democratic Republic. And it was written in 1971. So let's first look at the title. It says, Vivere. So vivere is an Italian word, which means to live. So the name of, uh, the meaning of the poem, poem's title is basically to live in peace. So if you know about the Sri Lankan history, you know that the 1971 was a particularly dark moment in our history because that was when the JVP insurgency took place. However, this particular poem was written before April 5th which was the start of the JVP insurgency. So now let's go to the first stanza. Why this obsession with Bo and his, his horrors, you ask? So the poem begins with this unnamed observer or journalist who is asking, why is there this meditation and preoccupation with Bo and its horrors? Because usually Bo and its devastating consequences or repercussions are usually what we associate with a lot of negative connotations. However, this is, this is a very problematic statement. The reason why is because we know the memories of violence, violent histories, traumas, sufferings cannot easily be forgotten. So you see that what this observer is asking is a very ignorant question because it is very easy for him to ask that spending his life in Sri Lanka, where he has experienced a time of relative peace and calm. And this is considering that during the time Ranasimha was writing this poem, the nearest this particular observer has been to violent death is through the cinema screen. So to him, death is very impersonal and a detached experience. However, that is not the case for Anne Ranasimha who, as you know, lost so many loved ones during the Holocaust. And then in the second stanza, she says, but what you have seen, there is one dimensional, lacks the second dimension of love, maybe a third of pain, a fourth of touch, blood is sticky and warm, burnt bodies disintegrate. So you see how the writer continues to critique and condemn the limitation of the observer's perceptions. And Ranasinghe does this in a very aesthetic manner too, right? Because she's insisting 
and appealing to both tactile and visual imagery, as well as the sensation of breeder. So when she talks about the blood being sticky and warm and burn bodies disintegrating, and then next, when she talks about the shadow seared, uh, seared in a wall that was a man in its original state, these all evoke very abject, dark, traumatic images of war, the kind of images which will forever be deeply entrenched to the memories of those who have experienced it or lost their loved ones as a result of war. So here, Rana Sinha particularly comments on the fear of war remaining as a festering canker. So what does that mean? Canker means an ulcerous condition or disease, and festering means it's becoming worse or more intense. So basically, what the poet means here is that the fear during these times, during these times of violence and conflict, is, uh, according to the poet, something you can never shake off. So even when the times of pain and suffering is over, the fear that remains with you is something that you can never take off because it is constantly with you, according to Ranasimha. So therefore, you see that through this dialogue in the poem between the writer and the observer, we are able to perceive two opposing or contrasting experiences and that is of the journalist as well as the writer, right? And this also accentuates the emotive and po poignant viewpoint of the author even more as well. Considering that the ignorant and inconsiderate perception of the observer is given a parallel, is given parallel to that of the writer who acknowledges the seriousness as well as the significance of remembering history, right? And we can also determine the tone that the writer is using as well, right? So what do you think about this tone? It's a very sarcastic tone. She comes across as condemning the journalist's ignorance and tries to create awareness about the impossibility of forgetting horrors of war. And then if we go to the third stanza, it says, you concede that artistically the works are good, this in a casual side, but you insist one was disturbed and horrified. Uh, so in the third stanza, you see that this critical attitude projected by the poet in stanza one is emphasized and highlighted here even more because we see that it is impossible for the observer's perceptions to stretch beyond his own life experiences and exposures. He does not attempt to be open-minded and understanding. That is what we can try to understand from the observer's perspective or viewpoint in this stanza. And then when we go to the final stanza of the poem, it says, Sir, you are revealing an art, not the emotion that caused it to blossom, judging technique, design, effect. An artist can only express the sum of his experience, not yours. So again, you see the very limited and inadequate uh, viewpoint of the reviewer. The scope of the reviewer remains, to, remains limited, right? He continues to remain ignorant because he cannot, uh, he cannot go beyond his own life experiences, as I have mentioned earlier. And then continuing on in the same stanza, Ranasina says, and then you demand, when will the Germans stop saying mea culpa? Never, I hope, for under their mea culpa lie buried millions of dead. And would you, for the sake of your comfort, that we forget? So mia culpa is actually a Latin phrase. And if you look it up, uh, it is used in a religious context, which basically means through my fault. It is basically an acknowledgement of having done wrong. And here we can say that uh, when the observer is demanding, when will the Germans stop saying mia culpa? Uh, Ranasina says, never, I hope. So we can understand that Ranasina hopes the Germans will never stop saying mea culpa 
because she's hoping that this overwhelming guilt and burdens the Germans bear due to the Jews who were murdered, massacred, and victimized by the Nazis during World War II will never be forgotten. And this violent history will forever be remembered because she is a person, she is a poet who always stresses, who always emphasizes on the importance of remembering, on the significance of remembering violent, the violent history, the times of conflict, uh, as opposed to forgetting it and living in a, uh, when you are living in a time of comfort, in a line, but in a time where there is no conflict, right? So we can say that uh, commenting on the few, the last few lines, Ranasinghe is voicing them in a very chilly and inescapable way, right? Because she's saying that you can never forget the traumatic, painful memories of suffering, horror, and tragedy. And then she insists that the recognition and acknowledgement of violence and war are mandatory, are extremely essential for one's coming into terms with the horror that it creates. So therefore, you can even say that through this poem, Rana Singha is creating awareness and raising consciousness. And this is the place where we are going to stop our analysis of uh, Rana Singha's poem, We Were in Peace. And in our next lecture, we will be looking at some more, some more poems by Rana Singha. Thank you very much for listening.